Good evening, everybody. This is the public meeting for the Greensboro uh, Transit Agency ADA Operational Analysis Project. And we are happy to have you here. Thank you for taking the time this evening to be with us. And um, I'm going to go through some housekeeping um, before we get into the conversation. And I'm sure that after one and a half year of pandemic, we kind of know how to use Zoom, but I wanted just to give a refresher. So at the bottom of your screen, you see different icons. Um, I think that right now you are all muted, except for um, if you are on the phone exclusively, I believe. Um, and then uh, you have the, the video that you can put on and off. Um, here you have the chat box, and we want to make this, this meeting a little bit interactive. So um, you can use the chat box to give us some answers to some questions we have through the presentation. Or you can, there is this reactions um, bottom here that has, um, you can raise your hand or you can uh, put, you know, different, different type of reactions. So um, please feel free to use the chat or the reactions when you want to uh, respond to our questions. And, and we hope we can have a good conversation through the, through the presentation. So um, this is the agenda for tonight. First, we are going to do introductions and I am Mariate Echeverri. I am with ACOM, uh, we are the the consulting firm that are developing the, the project. And I'm going to let the team members introduce themselves. And I would like to begin with George, who is uh, with the city of Greensboro. George, go Great. ahead. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is George Lenny, Transit Systems Analysis for the uh, city of Greensboro, Greensboro Transit Agency. Uh, proud to uh, have on our team here with ACOM uh, that's going to be, uh, that's performing our uh, ADA uh, analysis uh, for the city of Greensboro. And uh, uh, they have been with us, I guess, since uh, March of uh, early part of this year. And we have been just working diligently together just to uh, come up with a goal of making uh, GTA uh, paratransit services, the best services that we can provide, uh, just overseeing uh, things, of, uh, ways to improve and things that they can see that uh, that's going, uh, that could be corrected or could be done in a better way. And this is another part of the process of just hearing from the, the riding public. Uh, and we're happy to have them aboard and be able to uh, have this public meeting to to open it up to the public to hear from, from everyone, to just hear your voice and let us know how we're doing and what could we approve on. So thank you all for joining on uh, tonight and just eager to hear from, from our, our partners to see what they have for us this evening. So thank you again. Thank you, George. Uh, we also have Kearney, who is the Transit Service Program Coordinator. Kearney, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Courtney Rory. I'm the ADA Transit Service Program Coordinator for the City of Greensboro, um, and I am responsible for handling all of the eligibility for paratransit services. Um, thank you all for joining, and we look forward to the recommendations that AECOM will provide. Thanks, Courtney. And I'm going to give the word to Price, who is with my team. Thanks, Mariate. Um, hi, uh, I'm Price. Um, so I'm a, a transit planner uh, working on the data analysis, looking at the existing conditions. And it's been a real pleasure getting to uh, getting to know the good folks at GTA and also, um, you know, learning learning a, a lot about the system and looking forward to talking a little bit about what we uh, what we've learned so far and learning from you all um, about, you know, how you use the system. Thanks, Bryce. And Haley? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Haley Lloyd, and I'm a transportation planner with AECOM. Um, on this project, I'm helping out with the public involvement and stakeholder 
coordination and I look forward to continue working with you all. Thank you. Thank you. So um, in the agenda today, we have a brief project overview, and then we are going to talk a little bit about the demographics and uh, the data that we are looking at to perform this analysis. Uh, we are going to talk about the, the, the service per se, and what we see are good things and some challenges and the eligibility processes. And, um, and then we will talk about the next steps. So we have a question for you um, right here at the beginning. So I, please raise your hand or write it on the chat box um, if you are a current ADA customer. Let me see. Um, at least one hand. That's good. Are there any former ADA customers here? Yes. Good. Uh, caregiver, advocate, or healthcare professional? I didn't understand what you said. Is there, is there any caregiver, advocate, or healthcare professional? It seems that there's none. Great. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are going to do with this project. Uh, the, the main purpose is to evaluate the service delivery uh, we are looking at the financials. We are looking at how services operated, uh, the eligibility processes. And the idea is to identify efficiencies and identify ways to for GTA to provide a better service uh, through access GSO. And the study includes two phases. So the, the first phase, which is the one that we are developing right now, is the operation analysis where we um, look at all the data, you know, uh, a, a lot of numbers. Uh, we look at the maps, we look at the policies. And based on that data, we make an analysis and prepare uh, some recommendations. And then on phase two, we, we will do an implementation and action plan where we will um, kind of develop the way how those recommendations should be implemented. And so we think that um, it is really important for us to look at what the agency vision is, um, because that provides us some guidance in the in, in the process. So I'm going to read it. It's on the on the slide, but I'm going to read it. So the city's vision of an ideal ADA paratransit system is one that accommodates all eligible participants through transparent communication and that is supported by fixed route service and a robust innovator system. The city hopes the community will view the paratransit service as a well advertised solution for seniors, seniors and people with disabilities. And we also have some agency goals for this project. So um, the first one is to improve efficiencies. We are also looking uh, on the goals to refine the eligibility requirements lower the overall cost of providing services. And when, when we go through the data, you're gonna see why this is here. To improve the rider customer experience oh, and, I, and to provide adequate resources in planning and operations. And the, the project timeline, um, as you can see, uh, well, in, in the slide, there is a, a the, the, the first phase, which is the, this one that goes from March to December. So it's roughly nine months. That, and then during those nine months, we do the, all the operational analysis. We do assessment of eligibility and resources. 
and we develop those recommendations. So we hope, and, and it's in the schedule to have all of this ready by November. And it's, a, it's very important for, for GTA and for the city of Greensboro to have public involvement. So this is the first of three meetings that are going to be part of this project um, to hear what um, people have to say. But also as part of the public involvement, we have a survey that um, is, or is, the link is on the chat in this meeting. So you can click on, on, the, on that link and fill out the survey. Uh, once this, I, I hope once this meeting is over, so you um, you can tell us what you think. It's also on the Access GSO website, um, and and you can respond it there. And if you have any problems responding the survey, you can uh, contact us, and we will help you with that. And so the second phase of the public involvement is going to be uh, in November when we have some recommendations and we would like to hear your input and feedback on those recommendations and help us prioritizing. And then uh, we finalize the first phase in December and then we begin the second phase, which is the implementation. And for that, the public involvement will happen around March. We, we have to talk to George um, how that is going to look like, but that's kind of what we have in the schedule right now. And we will develop recommendations and service alternatives. And the goal is to finish by June of 2022. So price is going to uh, drive you through some of the data and statistics that we have been um, looking at. And, uh, and so price, it's all yours. Thank you, Mariette. Um... You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, so uh, as Mariette said, I'm, I'm going to be um, taking you through a few slides. Uh, you'll, you'll have to listen to me for a few minutes, but then really I'm, I'm eager to hear what, uh, what you all have to say. Um, because I, I, you know, it's very important to understand what, you know, how you use the system, your experience with it, areas for improvement, uh, because there's, there's uh, no replacement for the customer experience. Um, but just to quickly give a little bit of, um, you know, some of our findings that we've uh, that we've uh, gotten so far. Um, where we started was with a demographic analysis. So uh, we're trying to figure out sort of where the market is, priority areas for GTA to pay attention to within the Greensboro uh, area, within the service area. And so there are uh, four maps that I'm going to uh, talk about um, real quick. The first one is the minority map. And um, the reason that we look at this is from a federal perspective. Um, the federal government is very interested in its regulations and ensuring uh, equitable distribution of resources that um, federal resources are, uh, are, are used in a non-discriminatory way. And so, um, so we do this analysis to look at, you know, what, what are those, those priority areas? And um, we, we absolutely see in the um, Southeast East area is where the, um, uh, largest proportions of minority or people of color uh, live in the uh, in the service area, and for reference, it's um, people other than non-Hispanic white are considered minority for for this map. Um, if you'll move on to the next slide, please. You'll start to see a trend where this uh, area in the south and east um, keeps on coming up as a priority area, um, a, a key transit market in the region from a demographic perspective. Um, federal regulation also uh, uh, states that um, uh, funding and resources should be used in a non-discriminatory way also for uh, uh, low-income uh, uh, residents and riders. And, uh, and you see um, when looking at poverty that in the south uh, southern area, east area, southeast area is again where you see the majority of the, um, the low-income population. Ah, thank you, Marate, where the, where the cursor is, uh, is kind of cir circling. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, zero car households is actually pretty uh, related to low income households. And so again, unsurprisingly, I'm going to be driving home this point <laughs> um, for this slide in the next one. Uh, you see in the southeast area of Greensboro, the highest uh, proportion of households without a car. And that that's um, typically related to the um, uh, not having the financial capacity for a household to afford a car. And, and it's also really important, um, again, from a transit market perspective, uh, an equity perspective, uh, to provide service to um, to those areas and, and really focus, you know, communications, outreach, et cetera, um, where the households are more likely to um, to not have a car and therefore depend on public transportation. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, um, people with disabilities, uh, you know, the, the ADA service that we're talking about, the, and I, I'll use a couple of different terms here, ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, demand response, I, I, I might say, and these are all just referring to the um, the door-to-door -door, uh, wheelchair accessible van service that um, GTA provides. Um, so people with disabilities are the uh, are the folks who depend on this door-to-door uh, -door wheelchair accessible uh, service, and you can see yet again that in the southern sort of southeastern um, region is where you have the highest proportion of uh, of people with disabilities, and you know. This this spans uh, a whole range of disabilities, which I know we'll talk a little bit more uh, in the eligibility section, but um, cognitive uh, hearing or vision, um, physical impairments, you know, using a wheelchair or a scooter. Um, so there's a, a whole range of disabilities that, um, that people have, which uh, might make them depend on, uh, on the ADA uh, uh, service. And, and again, the final thing I'll say before I uh, move on to uh, some of the um, data and statistics on uh, the service is just that this underscores um, you know, again, where where is the 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 priority area within the the GTA region of uh, uh, of of the strongest market for uh, for the ADA service? Um, so, if, go to the next slide, please. Um, and actually, you can keep keep on rolling to the next one. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes just going through some of the findings. Um, from our dive into the uh, GTA data, uh, some of the ridership and service data. Um, I'm gonna make two points. So I'll just tell you right up front, uh, the, the two main findings that we had was that one, um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, ridership on the ADA uh, system had been growing. And then of course it you know took a big plunge in, in March and April of, uh, of 2020. So that's the, the first point that I'll make and I'll get in a little bit more detail. And then the second is that um, we have, have really flagged cost, uh, cost of service as uh, a major issue to, uh, uh, for the agency to be thinking about, uh, particularly in terms of the sustainability of the service. So um, in terms of looking at ridership, diving into that first point, um, I'm not sure how well the colors come across, but you can see there's a grouping of three lines on on this on this chart, and um, the 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 top three. So the bottom one is 2017, <laughs> the middle one is 2018, and then the top one is 2019. So what that's telling me is that every year ridership on the ADA system was was inching inching up. Um, it was a growing ridership. And then, of course, in uh, as I said, in in March or April, uh, March and April of 2020, um, just like transit agencies are around the country, it uh, it really plunged. Um, let's see, it went from about 25,000 uh, trips in uh, January to uh, under 10,000 in April, so a bigger than 50% drop. And it's it's been slowly, you know, inching its way um, back up. Um, and um, yeah, so this is very, very typical, but I think really important information as we're thinking about the system and thinking about moving forward, um, you know, what the changes in ridership demand are and what the pre-existing trends were. Uh, if you can go on to the next slide, please. Um, the way that I like to think about uh, demand response slash ADA <clears throat> and fixed route, um, I just want to take a moment to explain uh, demand response tends to be uh, uh, 
very expensive to serve relative to um, fixed route transit. So fixed route is like the big buses that you see on, on, on specific route schedules um, that go along a certain street. Um, this is generally because um, it, this isn't true for GTA necessarily, but as an industry standard, it's like 80% of running uh, a service uh, goes to paying the driver behind the wheel. And um, because uh, because a big bus can carry so many more people, you know, it can carry 50 people, uh, 60 people um, on a per trip basis, uh, the big bus service tends to be relatively cost efficient compared to the um, ADA service where you have one or two people in the wheelchair accessible vans. And so because this demand response service is, um, is relatively expensive on a per trip basis, um, you can, uh, I like to look at the ratio of uh, demand response to fixed routes, so the wheelchair accessible vans to the, the big buses. And you can see in 2017, 2018, and 2019, um, that the uh, that the proportion of demand response ridership has uh, it grew in each in each year, and so that's a trend that you know we're very interested in as we're doing this comprehensive assessment uh, because it's something that we want to keep a keep an eye on from a financial perspective, um, given how expensive uh, demand response is um, to to serve. Uh, next uh, next slide, please. Um, let's see, I think this is the final, yeah, this is the final slide before I get into the service cost information, but uh, this is the, uh, another important metric that we, um, that we like to look at is the trip performance rate. So if you think about it, you, um, uh, a person schedules a trip. Um, let's say, for example, they have a doctor's appointment the next day. Um, so they'll call up and they'll schedule the ride and, you know, they'll get the pickup time. And maybe after they schedule the, the ride, their doctor's office calls and says, ah, sorry, we've got to reschedule. So, um, so they might call up the uh, GTA and then cancel their ride. So that would be, uh, you know, a canceled trip. Um, and that would not count in this, uh, you can see in March, it was 73%. Um, so that 73% of all scheduled trips were actually taken. Um, that does not include canceled trips, which in that example, that would have been a canceled trip. Um, what's really important from a trip performance rate, we definitely want to minimize the number of canceled trips, but we really want to minimize the number of um, no-shows or late cancels because that in introduces a lot of um, inefficiency into the system. And while there's no particular standard, uh, industry standard, like 80%, 85%, 90%, um, in general, you want to raise that number as, as high as you can get it. Um, and, you know, I would say just from my experience working on other systems, 73, you know, 64 to 73% is very typical. Um, but, you know, as I said, you, you always want to get it as high as you can. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to spend just a few more slides uh, talking about cost uh, because this is something that we uh, really identified as we've gone through the um, as we've gone through the the data. The first is just overall cost of running the ADA service. Um, you can see in the in the pink um, pink bars that's the demand response cost, and particularly since 2016 ish, uh, the cost of running the demand response system has has really increased. Um, you can actually see that uh, it's gone up uh, in 2019 relative to 2010. Um, it was over 70% uh, increase in the cost of running the service. Um, at the same time, the cost of running the fixed route uh, system has gone up by, uh, well, in 2019, it was under 10%. In 2020, it's a little under 20%. You know, it goes up and down. It fluctuates a little bit year to year, um, but, but we're seeing a much greater increase in the cost of running the demand response system. And so this is something that, you know, we're really interested in because, um, because as I said, demand response is already so expensive to run relative to fixed route. Um, and we want to see a, you know, a financially sustainable service uh, uh, providing mobility and access, you know, getting people to the doctor or the grocery store, picking up their prescriptions. Um, but, you know, you have to have the dollars to pay for it and, uh, and to run a sustainable system. So that's one, one really um, crucial metric that we've been looking at. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and then you can look at it on a per trip basis. So um, if you think about it, that was the total cost that we were just looking at. On a per trip basis, we see the same increase in the, the cost of running uh, the demand response system, although not as pronounced. Um, it's in the dark blue line. The, the um, cost uh, per trip has gone up by, sorry, I have something on my screen that's obscuring the number. Um, it's gone up by, you know, about 20% percent-ish. Um, fixed route has actually gone up more. Uh, we think it's because ridership has gone down on fixed route, and so on a per per trip basis, that makes it relatively more expensive. But um, but again, going back to our, the sort of overall point, um, you know, we're very interested in the cost and why costs have gone up and thinking about what the future of, uh, of the system is going to be and the sustainability of the, of the system given these cost trends. Uh, next slide, please. The final point that I'm going to make before I uh, summarize and then, and then hear from, from you all is just that um, the fare box recovery ratio is, is another key cost metric. And uh, we, we wanted to put this uh, chart on to demonstrate that because the cost of a trip on, um, on the demand response system is relatively high, um, fares, so the, the, the amount of, of that cost that is recouped is relatively low by paying fares. So it's only about 3% of the cost of running the system is, uh, is recouped by the fares, is covered by the, the cost of fares. And so, you know, the majority, 97%, is, uh, is covered by other funding sources from the federal government, the state, local, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in summary, just to, just to, you know, hit those couple of points again, um, you know, we've, we, we found that, well, I'll go even further back. I'll talk real quickly about the demographics. We found that, uh, you know, it's the south, southeast, east area of the service area that um, is probably the prime transit market and the area that um, GTA should probably be focusing uh, or prioritizing um, uh, from a demographic perspective. Um, and then for, in terms of the service and, and financial information that we, that we found, um, we, we see GTA as a well-run system, but the cost trends in particular um, uh, present a, a potential threat to the future sustainability of the, of the system. And, and, um, and you know, something that will take that trend into the, the next phases that Mariate was talking about in terms of thinking about you know, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and you know, how does that feed recommendations that we have. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm just going to pose one question, uh, Mariate, if you'll go to the next slide. So it's a very broad question, but I think probably the most important one that I can think to ask is what improvements would you like to see in the ADA system? And um, you can either enter it into the chat or uh, raise your hand and then unmute. Um, yes, I see Glenda Jackson. Yes, I want to know why is it when I make a reservation for a pickup, they give me a 30 minute window for the um, bus to get here to pick me up. But many a times they have been late picking me up. And why do I have to wait 30 minutes for, uh, for a ride and they can be 15 or 20 minutes late? I can answer that at a high level, <laughs> and and then maybe and then maybe I don't know if anybody from the agency or, or Mariate wants to step in. Uh, first, I'll just say I I'm really I I I understand exactly what you're saying. I um, I. I can't imagine. So I don't. I don't use the the demand response system, um, but you know it's easy for me to just sort of like hop in my car or hop on my bike and go wherever I want. You know, whenever I want. And so it's really disruptive. And I, I totally understand um, how how challenging that is when you're when you're given a window and it seems like a really long window, anyway. And then and then you have to wait even longer. So I just want to just state like I I totally understand your frustration. Um, I I know uh, in general the 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 um, 
the scheduling system tries to like make it as efficient as possible because of the cost that I was talking about. Like they are scheduling the the trips as tight as tightly as they can so that you don't have a driver at any point sitting, you know, twiddling his or her thumbs waiting to go pick up the next person. And so because it's like tight as a drum, the people are always on the go. Anytime there's a delay, anytime there's a no show, anytime there's a doctor's appointment that runs long, it ends up cascading down to all of the subsequent um, pickups. And I know that's not maybe a satisfying answer, but um, I, that's something that I've, I've seen. I've seen a lot. So, Mariate, it seems like you might have something to say. Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, we are also looking at the on-time performance. And we didn't put it in the presentation today because we it, we wanted to focus more on the kind of the, the ridership, the cost data, and also the eligibility processes. But we are looking at all those elements um, to see where there, there, there is room for improvement. So if the if they are not picking you on time or if the waiting times are too long, that's those are some of the things that we are looking at and that we of course want to hear from you if those are issues so we can work on on resolving um, providing some uh, try to provide some efficiency there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um I think De Deanna yes. De Liberto Yes. Um, so I, I'm, I've been generally happy with SCAD. I mean, yeah, there are those days where they come late, but for the most part, my experience has been very pleasant with them. My concern is, and I raised this, you know, during the budget um, hearings, and that is that those of us who are on low income, which is pretty much anybody who receives Social Security disability, um, our paychecks go up 10 cents. Uh, a year, if that much, and yet SCAT is going to be raising its fare um, 50 cents um, in January for, per ride. So if we get 10 cents a month, I don't, I just don't see how the lower income people can uh, can afford it. And I'm also concerned about changing. I mean, I'd like to hear more, I guess, about what your recommendations are in terms of eligibility uh, requirements, because in my case, a lot of people probably don't think I need SCAT, but because of my vision, I can't drive and I can't get around Greensboro without a car. So um, I'm just want to make sure that people who, you know, it's not just people who are in wheelchairs or have obvious disabilities that are going to be allowed to take SCAT in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I see another hand raised, the 336. Yeah, the uh, person on the phone um, ending in 4115. 4115, yeah. Um, yes, this is um, Alfred Inglesby. And if you really want to analyze what's going on, I think you guys have to look at the beginning processes especially when we've had a mass quitting of the drivers. I work at Industries of the Blind, which 96 employees of Industries of the Blind use Access GSO for transportation to and from work. So you're looking at 960 trips in a five-day period, Monday through Friday, 30, over 3,600 trips on a monthly basis, where we're shoved on a van anywhere from three people to nine people to get to and from work. And that's pretty regularly. There's breakdowns in communication with reservations where people can call, make reservations, have a witness. And then when it's time for that trip, they're told by dispatch that trip does not exist. There's breakdown where there's people who are dispatching and in, in scheduling are not from the city. They do not understand how the city of Greensboro is laid out and they make these last minute changes and groupings for trips that anyone who lives in the city knows would be problematic. Because I know the grouping from in my area on Hargate Street, if we have a coworker who lives on Anita Glen, that's 12 minutes going out to Anita Glen and 12 minutes back to my home. So the right there is 24 minutes 
of myself and other passengers being on the vehicle going out to the Anita Glen area of the city. And it's been brought up to dispatch and supervisors multiple times. That's not a good grouping that that needs to be looked at and changed. And it's not being changed. The drivers feel overwhelmed. They don't feel like they can communicate to supervisors, dispatchers, management, because they just feel like it's falling on deaf ears. So the whole process has to be looking, not just that cost analysis, because, well, it costs this much to go from the here to here, but you're not seeing the six, seven, eight, nine employees waiting 35, 40 minutes in 90 degree weather, waiting for a van to show up because it's late. So really look at the, the people here who are taking the services to and from employment, school, doctor's offices, and if you want to compare the cost of things, the city of Greensboro has grown since 2010 or any other metric here you want to look at. The city council just annexed more area of the city into the city where there is no fixed route transportation. So if people lived out there, their only means of transportation to go to the grocery store or the doctors or working is via the paratransit if they're eligible for paratransit. Mm -hmm. So just really look at all of the day-to-day -day stuff that us riders have to look at and hear and absorb every single day, not just charts that people who can see the charts can see the charts and people like myself who are blind have to rely on someone describing the charts. Mm -hmm. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Alfred, can I ask a, a follow-up? question yeah yes. i just want to make sure so you you touched on a couple of things one was um w one had to do with trip groupings and understanding of geography and then another had to do with driver turnover and then you also touched on uh communications between driver staff and dispatch and scheduling is it, I'm I'm uh -huh. curious. I'm curious. One, did I miss anything? Because this was all really valuable feedback. And number two, do any of those like if you had to choose one as, as the biggest issue, it, do any of them leap out to you as as the biggest the, the the biggest issue to really to really take on and dive into? It's at the same level because if you try to pick apart one of it, it if a driver sees that there's a grouping of nine people. And they try to point it out to dispatch and say, hey, th this is not feasible. There's going to be passengers on on this route for over an hour, and I'm already going to be late picking them up. And dispatch just says, well, run it the way it is. That's all we can do. So then you, you got the overcrowding of the passengers. The mm -hmm. over I don't know what happened, but just in the last 30 days, We've been told that there's been like 18 drivers that just upped and quit and they had experience driving for whatever you want to call it, access GSO or SAT. And that's primarily what we hear if there's delays is, oh, we're short on drivers. We're short on drivers. That's all we can say. We're short on drivers. Mm -hmm. So it's all at the same level because if you try to analyze one part of it, the other parts equal out to the same level. Okay. All right, thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Yeah, and I wanted to remind everybody that uh, there is a survey that you can access on the um, Access GSO website. We are also putting the link on the chat uh, in a couple of minutes, in a couple of seconds. Um, and um, you can click the link and it was going, it's going to take you to, uh, yeah, it's there right now. It's going to take- well, What is the link? See, the, that's the thing about being blind. If, even if I had the Zoom screen of the chat, I wouldn't be able to read the chat to know the link was there. Yeah, and- but See, the, so those, those are the things that get overseen, that get overlooked. Well, the other thing that we can help you fill in the survey. If, so if you need assistance, we, we can help you with that. Um, well, I'm just saying be more, more, I'm just saying just be more cognitive when you say there's a link in the chat, maybe say what the link is, or if you're reviewing charts, share the information, all of the information on the chart so people who are blind and listening 
can yeah. kind of have a an idea of where you're at, not just hearing, well, there's a chart that describes this, but there's other information there. Yes, correct. Yeah, and uh, but uh, again, if um, I I don't know if you were aware of the survey and if you can tell your colleagues that there is a survey. We really, I mean, we are taking notes of all your comments that we will really uh, love to hear from everyone that has an opinion um, about the Access GSO. So if, if is there know, any plans for you guys coming to Greensboro to actually meet with some of the em employee groupings like Industries of the Blind or the dialysis center riders, because that's a big chunk of your ridership is those two groupings. Yeah, and so we are actually uh, going to have some meetings with them. Yes. Yeah, that's because right, I'm one of those 96 employees at Industry of the, of the Blind that uses Access GSO, and we had to use it during the whole pandemic because we were considered essential employees mm -hmm. since we had direct federal contracts. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we are planning on talking to industries for the blinds and with the dialysis centers. We are aware that it's it's a it's big it's a big deal. Yeah. So, but thank you for for bringing it to our attention again. Is there any other hand raised? Um, I see Deanna's hand is still raised, but it might just be up from the prior comment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was I was just wondering if anybody was going to address my comments at all. So you you were um, right. You uh, said that um, you're talking about fare increases uh, going up higher at a at a faster clip than increases in fixed income. Right. And I mean, I'm. Mariate, I would defer to you if I, I can I can respond sort of at a, at a high level and and just very I, I guess on a very human level like I I totally understand what you're saying and I, I really um, I, I I understand that when you have uh, when you're on a fixed income and money is tight and then fares go up by fifty cents on a service that you use maybe twi twice a day you know for weekdays that that is that is a real a real burden. Um, you know, I guess I I would only also say that you know there's it's hard it, there's pressure again going back to cost and I know that we I feel like I'm kind of beating a dead horse there's a lot of upward pressure on the cost and the cost sustainability so uh, a lot of pressure to at, at least do periodic fare increases to help yeah but I uh, I think with, with all due respect your company mm -hmm. you know like it's coming in. And you're, I think you're the driving force behind, behind like what you're going to recommend to the city of Greensboro. And you guys need to understand that, you know, that not everything in a budget is going to balance. Not everything's going to be a profit making mm -hmm. um, issue. And you got to look at people who are, you know, there's got to be some mechanism in there for people who are low income. There are probably some people that can afford the increase, but there's mm -hmm. a significant number of senior citizens and myself included, who just are not going to be able to keep affording 50 cents each year increases for ride. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so one of the things that we are looking at, we are looking at that as well as an overall, um, in the overall analysis. But I think I would like uh, George to address this question because the fair increase is something that came before we even uh, began this project. And um, so George, if you have something um, that you can tell Mrs. Deliberto, uh, that would be great. So, yeah, so if, if, as many of you all know that, uh, you know, part of the uh, process um, since the beginning of this year is to look at our overall budget um, with uh, not only with um, assets GSO, but with the um, entire um, GTA budget. And one of the um, uh, things that, that was brought up is the, um, the fair uh, for um, SSGSO GSO and, and how it compares to 
uh, the other uh, systems around in North Carolina and and um, and where we are have our fares, it hasn't really changed in so many years. And so with that, um, you know, uh, it was brought to our attention that we, that was something that we need to look at. So th that process actually started, I guess, before we actually started with um, uh, this 88 uh, analysis. Uh, it, uh, it was prior to uh, March and and we had, um, and we knew it was kind of going to kind of clash in a sense because we wanted to kind of start this process kind of after we finish up with the uh, public meetings with the uh, fare increase and things of that nature so that it wouldn't, you know, we want to uh, not have everything kind of directed just looking at fare increase only when we look at this particular analysis. So that is, you know, but it is important. Uh, it's something to you know definitely just you know keep in mind, um, as you know that it did uh, it did pass. You know the original uh, thought was to uh, um, pretty much um, double the fare, uh, uh, the maximum which it was been three dollars per trip. Um, that was um, the first uh, recommendation. But as you know, we went through the the uh, process, uh, the public comment process. And, and at that time, you know, we heard from the public and saying that, you know, that's just so too much of a, of a jump all at one time to go from $1.50 all the way up to $3 per trip. So we, um, we heard the, uh, you know, the comments and, and that it was addressed um, at the uh, city council meeting. And so that's when it was um, uh, recommended that the uh, it will go from a uh, dollar fifty to fifty cents uh, to two dollars starting in uh, January of next year, and so that process, like I said, is all have been pretty much set in stone prior to us coming and, and, and coming with this process here. So, um, but that will continue to be looked at for the future because uh, on that um, budget it's also looking at going 50 cents per year. So that will be something that will be looked at. Yeah, I, I would object to that 50 cents increase per year. I mean, it's, you can't get blood from a stone. I was involved with those public hearings as well. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with everything you said. I'm just trying to say that there needs to be um, an increase on the fixed route perhaps, and an understanding that people who are low income are not gonna be able to sustain this. I mean. Right. It's just not going to happen. I'm I moved from New Jersey um, to Greensboro primarily because I couldn't afford to live in New Jersey and get around. And I don't want to be stuck in a house just because I can't get around because I can't afford scat. Mm -hmm. That's where I, that's where I see this happening. It's and it's not just with me. There's other people, but those people people who have jobs. I mean, I, of course, everybody's going to say they don't want the increase, but but you know there are people who are more ca able to afford it. Um, than other people who are on social security. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, the point is well taken. I think it's something that we, you know, definitely will keep in mind and, and keep it a part of, of the analysis as, you know, the mm -hmm. future uh, recommendations for the increases. So we, we, we hear you and we're definitely going to uh, keep that uh, in the process of this analysis. Yes, yeah, because to go on, to go on to her point, the largest minority in this country is the disabled population, and you got anywhere whatever statistics you want to look at from seventy to eighty percent of the disabled population is unemployed. So you're already creating a minority of a, a group of people that are already stuck on a very tight fixed income, mm -hmm. and some of them is not due to their circumstances, is how they have to live in a group home and the group home structures because the state dictates how much the group home can charge. Those individuals only have so much money to pay for trips. And yeah, we're in a unique position where Access GSO can take us anywhere in the city limits. And we fought very hard for many of years to keep that because we know there's areas of the city where fixed route is basically a desert. There's no fixed route buses in certain areas of the city. So you can't mm -hmm. get from point A to point B, you're stuck. Yep, yep, thank you. Yeah, we are we are incorporating all these comments into the, the public engagement portion and 
we will have um, recommendations as we continue. But I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue with the presentation uh, because I don't want to keep you here longer than we need to, and we still have some other questions for you. And um, so please save your energy because we want to continue hearing from you. Okay. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the eligibility process, and you are all familiar with this process, right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, I'm going to do just a very uh, brief overview of the eligibility uh, and what is in place right now. So there are all the process and procedures to go through the, through the eligibility to get certified. There is the functional assessment and the there is also the site assessment. So we are looking at, at, oops. Can you see my screen? Oh. Yes, we, we could. Yeah, sorry, my my screen suddenly got black and um, I couldn't do anything. So let me get to the part of the presentation where, let me, let me go this way. My apologies. You know that technology is great until it's not. And um, so in the, um, I was talking about the certifications. So right now, currently the, the city has three types of certifications. Uh, is the full certification, the conditional and the temporary. So the, the full certification, is uh, kind of granted access to the access GSO, people that cannot write fixed route under any circumstances. The conditional certification is for people that can, um, that could write fixed route if, the, if there were no barriers. So for instance, perhaps a person can get to the bus stop that because the sidewalk uh, is not in good shape or because the, <clears throat> There are no ramps to access the, the bus stop. That person cannot do it. So that person is given a conditional certification. And then there are the temporary certifications that could be, for instance, a, someone that has an accident and, and needs to write ADA for, for, a little, for, a, for a short period of time. Or someone that comes and visits Greensboro and uh, needs to, um, to, to, to move around. And the steps to get the certification uh, you have to go through an application, and then the application has a professional verification that is usually a doctor. There is an application, the application review that is done by the Transit ADA um, service coordinator, and, and with, who is Kearney, and then uh, there is an interview and an in-person functional assessment, and then the eligibility determination. So um, if the person that is looking for certification cannot get certified and is denied the certification, there is an appeal process that actually has two steps. And so you can appeal and the assistant public transportation division manager will evaluate that, appeal, that, that appeal process and um, and if the person that is looking for certification is still not um, doesn't agree with the decision uh, when it has been denied, that person can appeal again. And this time uh, is the director of public transportation who's going to look at it. So it's a, it's a comprehensive process. Um, one of the, I think the most important things that is being done right now is the functional assessment. And what the functional assessment does is that it determines if the person is in um, any way uh, restricted to take um, to take fix, fixed route or kind of what, what is the ability to move around uh, either with mobility devices um, and what is the ability to to you know to move around on your own. So there are different things that that are looked at under the functional assessment. Um, how people can navigate in simulated ADA compliant uh, sidewalks and curb cuts, if the person can navigate slopes and uneven surfaces, if the person can cross the streets um, at controlled intersections, 
if uh, there, there is possibility to go up and down the stairs, if the person needs to use the lifts uh, in, in a van, and the ability to perform the fair transaction. Those are the main elements. And then there is the site assessment that is kind of a, um, an additional step. And this is usually um, required for the new paratransit applicants and that use wheelchair, scooter, or are visually impaired. So there are a number of things that the agency is looking at. They're looking at the type of disability, the type of mobility device that they are using, what are the, the uh, origins and destinations where the person needs to travel more frequently, if there are bus stops next to the um, to the applicant's home. I know, Diana, you were talking about um, areas that have no fixed route at all. So uh, Access GSO is the only one that can take persons uh, to places. Uh, the existence of sidewalks and also the condition of those sidewalks is, is really important when you are looking at um, some disabilities. The, uh, the barriers that can be to access a stop and if the person can load, uh, it can go on a van or if uh, there are ramps at the home or destination sites of those persons. So this is also very comprehensive. Oh, oops. This is also very comprehensive. Uh, we think that it, it's, it works, and, and we are still in the process of doing the analysis, and we think that it works, it, it's, it's, it's doing what is required, um, and the, the FTA, ADA regulations are very rigid with what the agencies uh, can do, and, uh, and making sure that the, the riders can really get the best service that they can get. So we think that this is this is very good, but we are also looking at what can be improved on these uh, eligibility assessments. Perhaps the frequency of for to apply for them could be one of the things that we we will look at it. I mean, if you have a permanent dis a permanent disability, probably there's no need for you to be applying <clears throat> every three years. You just need to update your 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 car or, or your you know your file and uh, so with this this is kind of the 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 bulk of the presentation we have um some other questions for you so uh what is the biggest challenge using access gso and we heard in the prior question some of some of the challenges but is there something else that comes up after you heard um, about the eligibility processes and uh, you hear about the fixed routes. Is there anything else that is, is really a challenge for you using the system? Well, you kind of hit on part of it at your last little bit about if you're permanently disabled, like I am totally blind, we shouldn't have to go through the whole application process every three years because my vision is not going to magically come back mm -hmm. three years after the first three years of being approved. And I've worked with Courtney and the lady before Courtney, Ms. Sharia, for years on this, and I know they do a great job looking at the eligibility requirements, but I don't know if they need to have more training or actually work with more with like an O&M instructor to understand people's vision impairments because everyone's vision impairments is different from one person to the next. So you can't just have a black and white standard of that's acceptable, that's not acceptable, because there's gray areas, because if it's sunny out or cloudy out, or if it's raining out, it changes what that person can or not able to see. Mm-hmm, totally, mm hmm yeah. Yeah, thank you, that's a really great comment. Is there anyone else that would like to talk about the challenges? Well, the challenge for me, if I was going to, if, if there was a fixed route bus near my home, 
Um, the, the challenge for me being a vision problem is similar to other people's and that that is, if you've never been to that place before, you don't know if the sidewalks are uneven or if you're going to be able to reverse the uh, the hills or curbs or what have you. You just don't know in advance what the location is going to look like. So if you want to use fixed route, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the challenges. And if you were near a bus stop, um, you're going ahead of me. That was my next question. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, I it's, that. It's really good. It's really good. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So yeah, we yeah we we understand that that can be a really uh, big challenge to try to trying to transfer people from the uh, access GSO to the fixed route, and it's actually one of the things that we are looking at um, because of that. Anyone else wants to talk to us about the challenges? Mrs. Well, again, when it comes to some of those challenges, and I know Courtney and then Pastoria have done some training with people, but some people are afraid to even get basic training on fixed route buses because they know if it's a staff member from GTA or Access GSO, it's not going to be looked upon them favorably for learning something new, even in their own neighborhood. So there has to be a way to prevent that negative connotation of wanting to learn and wanting to be more independent, but you don't want to look too independent because you know if someone from Access GSO or GTA sees you doing it, they're just going to report you and then you're going to have problems for eligibility. I understand. So is this, is this training for the to be able to ride fixed route is what you are saying? In the past, I know someone wanted to learn how to take a fixed route bus from like the depot or near to the home. If they called and asked like Courtney or Sharia in the past, they would be hesitant to do that because they would have that negative connotation that if they know I can maybe do this trip once every month, mm -hmm. it might be held against my eligibility because in their mind, they see me do it one time, so they think I can do it all the time. Yeah. And I know people with vision impairments, their vision changes just on what the weather conditions are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I... So, you know, having a, a way for people to get the training to have the independence, but not have that negative connotation that, oh, my goodness, if staff sees this, I'm going to be switched from permanently certified to conditional or completely off the system. Because mm -hmm. people are worried about that. There's, you know, the, it, Access GSO is our livelihood. It helps us to go to work. It helps us get to medical appointments. It helps us to even have a normal social life, to go into church, going out to dinner, doing things with our kids of gymnastics or judo. You know, it's a daily part of our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really it's, it's it's a really important service. We are totally aware of that. Anyone else wants to comment on the biggest challenge personally? And we heard some things if in the prior question like um think that not having your trips on time and or Waiting. Like to try an extension, you may do so now. Okay. Um, and um, there, is there anything else that comes to mind? Well, that's the biggest thing right now that I know with my coworkers is these light trips. This all of a sudden mass amount of light trips, getting to work, being picked up from work. I mean, it's happened to me where just in June, there was four trips that they had to refund me my my fare because I was outside of the 30-minute window being picked up and being on one of those large groups. Okay, so I could chime in and add, this doesn't happen very frequently, okay? But one of the challenges I run into being visually impaired and people think that if you wear glasses, 
that you can see 2020. Um, I've had one or two drivers be very rude to me because I couldn't tell that they were talking on a phone because uh, they had their headphones on as they were talking and they could have handled it a lot better in terms of saying, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'm on the phone. Um, they need to be better trained to deal, to understand vision disabilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And that was something in the past that we had was the drivers or any employee of Access GSO went through some form of sensitivity training of all disabilities. So they would have a concept of what it's like to be in our shoes on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I don't know, George would have to tell you when the last time any of that training has occurred, but with some of the newer drivers, it doesn't seem to be at the level it used to be at. Thank you. Yeah, this, these are all great comments, and we are taking note of all of them. See Price, and you don't see Haley, but she's also taking notes. My notes are terrible, so I rely on them. <laughs> I'm going to go to the next question. Um, and um, just to continue the conversation, and we talk a little bit about this, but maybe there are some other things that you can think of. Uh, and the question is what improvements to the fixed route network will entice you to choose it over door-to-door -door service? It would have to expand. You have areas of the city that where there's zero fixed route services. There's just no way for you to walk to, or you do try to get to a bus stop, you're walking one, two, three, maybe four or five miles to get to a bus stop because the bus, the fixed route buses are kind of clustered in one section of the city, not spread out throughout the whole city. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but it would have to not end up taking two and a half hours to get someplace because most of the routes start at a certain location and then they have to go to the depot and then you end up having to take another bus or two to get to where you're actually going to finally end up going. Mm -hmm. So the routes would have to change. And then one other thing, uh, speaking uh, for myself, um, I live in a senior citizen building and the closest route bus to us is almost a half a mile away. So all of us in here that do not have cars have to use SCAT. Mm -hmm. Cause we don't have no sidewalks. Right. So it's, so it is no way for anyone um, to get to it unless they're gonna walk in the street. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, have, you... I have bad knees and I have to use a lift. I can't even walk up the steps. And other people that are living here, because this is a senior citizen building, are in walkers and wheelchairs. So we have no choice but to use SCAT. Mm -hmm. To go grocery shopping, like the doctor, or like whatever, okay? And they, I don't know how, and, and this is something that I don't understand, and I have never understood it, even when I was working before I retired. I don't understand how a company from the outside can come in and tell us, when I say us, I mean the city of Greensboro, what the best choice is, because you don't live here. Even when I was working, I could not understand how a company could come in and tell us how to work when they don't know what we're doing. You know, people need this, but like the lady said, we are on the fixed income. Like I said, I live in a senior citizen building. We are on the fixed income and a raise 50 cents this year, 50 cents next year. After a while, it's going to be a $5 uh, uh, like a wait trip. Who can afford that? But you are telling us what to do. And, and I don't understand. I really don't. How can y'all do this and y'all don't live here? 
you don't see what we have to go through. It, yeah, and that's why we are talking to you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it, it, and to your question, it's more of it's more than just DTA. You would actually need to get the Greensboro Department of Transportation to work very heavily on getting sidewalks mm -hmm. put into these areas where there is fixed route buses or they're planning on putting fixed route buses. It's not, oh, let's put a fixed route bus stop here and then five years later put a sidewalk in. You really need that coordination for the sidewalks to go in, then the bus stops. So it's kind of more than just a GTA question and answer. It's really getting in the Department of Transportation for the city involved in changing their ways of thinking on infrastructure with sidewalks and the necessary crosswalks and all of that extra stuff that goes along with that. Yeah, and and, and that's why we are asking this question. I mean, that's a, re a really great comment because one of the things that we are looking at is the sidewalk, sidewalk network. So looking at where the fixed route is going and how the city is served with sidewalks, because we, we know that that's a reason why many people may not be able to access the, the bus stop. Yes, so and, when you're, and when you're visually impaired, you can't see street signs. So mm -hmm. even though I know that there's a mechanism where they announce the stops, when that doesn't work, you're stuck with a bus driver who doesn't know the stops either. And therefore you have no idea where to get off your bus. Yeah, well, they yeah. have to tell you, yeah. they have to tell you this is it's, it's, Well, they don't, they don't. I've had bus drivers tell me, I have no idea where that is. And if you get off at a bus stop that might have a ditch or a hole next to it and you don't know it's there, as soon as you get off the bus and take a step, you have, you have the ability of injuring yourself. Yep. Exactly. And then you're just kind of stuck there until someone who can see you comes and checks on you. That's why the, the bigger picture is really getting the city department of transportation involved so we can have the sidewalks and those areas of bus stops neat and clean and set up a way that is accessible right from day one of a bus stop, not six months later, not a year later, not five years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, and it has to be maintained. It has to be, it has yeah. to be maintained. Yeah. And let me ask you, um, so if these things were resolved, if you had a sidewalk that goes to your building and you have all the ramps that you need to have to navigate and there are no obstacles and there is a good shelter to wait for the bus and the bus arrives and the buses all provide announcements where they are stopping. Um, will you consider riding fixed routes if all the conditions are ideal? And, and that's kind of a, a dream, but I, I, I just want to, to, to understand if that's something that you will consider. Out here where I live at, they have tried to put in sidewalks the homeowners fought it. They did not want sidewalks in because if they put a sidewalk in, they got to go onto onto these homeowners' property to build a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And this and this was like ten years ago. The homeowners said that that they didn't want to, that they did not want to give up any of their property. Like I said, the closest bus stop. It's almost a half a mile away. And even if they put in a sidewalk, this is a senior citizen building with people in wheelchairs. How are they gonna get up there to catch to catch a bus? How are they gonna do it? I know I can't walk it. I walk in the game. So how can I walk almost a half a mile away? Like for a bus. Yeah, and that's, that's what I'm asking for the ideal condition. So the bus will be near you. Um, so if you had the ideal condition, would that be something that you will consider? Would the bus stop is gonna stop out here at the end of my street? Yep. If that was the case, if your bus stops on your street. 
Yeah, and, and this because those are the things that we need to that we want to uh, to look at um, because of that cost that price talk about. Um, so looking at if people will be willing to or able to more than willing if they will be able to uh, move to the fixed route if the fixed route has dramatic improvements or really work for you but you would save money for transportation but your infrastructure cost would increase so that would be another part of the g dot that would be looking to save some money well the thing is uh when you have capital um so capital expenses have a different impact on on your budget than operational expenses. And what happens with transit in general is not only access GSO, but also the fixed route is that you have this operational expense that is uh, increasing year by year and is always there. When, when you put it, for instance, a sidewalk, you have a big expense, but it's in one time and then you just have maintenance, you know? So, um, and also with the with federal funding, you you get uh, more funding with the you, you can you have the possibility to to get additional funding with capital uh, expenses than with operational expenses. So that's why we are looking. We are trying to look at all the angles to see uh, how we can. Um, so to, 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 so to go more in depth with what you just said, then. And this has been brought up by some city residents and a few city council members. What if GTA all of us decided to cut out the contracting company and the city itself provides the transportation? Would that be a cost saver? Is that something y'all are going to be looking at as a cost analysis? Well, the the um. Because I know it costs money for them to contract it out to Keolius or any other transportation uh, companies and i'm not sure if if this is something that uh that george has mentioned um before that the city has the, the transit service is unionized and because transit service is unionized the city of greensboro cannot bargain with the union so well they have to get the state law changed yeah in well, a perfect ideal situation that you just proposed to us Yes. And the yes. same cost analysis that you're doing for trips and all of the expenses, that should be a possible cost analysis too for the city has a full picture that if they decide to go to Raleigh and ask the state representatives to change the law to allow them to do that because it would be more cost effective for the city, that's information they should know now instead of later. Yeah, I, I believe that some cities have tried to do that, um, but it has not moved forward. And but as you say, it would be ideal if they don't have to mm -hmm. to contract out. Um, yeah, that would be ideal. And that should lower the costs, which yes. in return keep the fares a little bit more reasonable for us riders who are on fixed incomes. For everybody. Yeah, for everyone. Yeah. And uh, so I'm looking at the time right now. This this is a great conversation. I'm I'm so happy that you are very participative. And uh, but I'm going to just finalize the, the presentation, and we will have we have 12 minutes left. Um, and just finish here. And if there are some last and final thoughts, we can um, we can talk about it. I I think I only have one more slide. And I just wanted to talk to you about the next steps. Um, so as I mentioned, we are doing this operation analysis and the, the goal is to have all the assessments, the operational assessment, the eligibility assessment and resources, looking at the staff and uh, the management company and uh, all of that. Um, we are going to have that ready um, by November. And then we will have another public meeting and um, where we will discuss recommendations and then we will pre prepare a report. 
And then we will begin the implementation plan, which is the phase two. And we will have another public meeting as part of that. And um, hopefully at that time, we can have some something different that is not only Zoom. So yeah, and yeah, we can, we can talk about that. So when is your guys' plan to have the in-person meetings with the uh, employers and the dialysis centers? to get their feedback before making recommendations. Well, I'm sorry, what was the question? When, and in that timeline, when are you guys planning on having those in-person meetings with like Industries of the Blind employees or the clients that are go to the dial dialysis centers in the city? When are you gonna have those in-person meetings with the other stakeholders? Yeah, it, it's not going before to be, making recommendations. Yeah, it, the meetings are going to be uh, on Zoom or Teams, and um, but it's going to be in the next couple of weeks. So it's part of this. It's, it's part of what we are doing right now, collecting collecting information uh, from from the stakeholders and from the public. So um, yeah, and the stakeholders will be involved um, through through the process as well. And um, then... yeah, and so that's all I have for for you today. And in my final slide, I have George' uh, email address and um, and my email address. But you can find those on the website. And uh, and again, I would like to remind you to fill out the survey. And if you know other people that. Um, are interested in the service that have opinions about the service, please ask them to, to complete the survey. There is, I mean, it's, it's multiple choice, but also we have a piece where you can put your thoughts and we will we will really want to hear your thoughts about the system. And uh, I think that Haley just put it back in the chat, yes. And again, if you have any problems completing the survey, please contact, um, you, you can co contact uh, GTA and we can help um, with, with the process. We can help you filling out the surveys. Well, George, I'll pass that along to my coworkers. Thank you so much. That will, that will really be great and will help us a ton. And if I should uh, also add, I just want to thank everyone that's uh, on this call and on this Zoom uh, for your participation and your feedback. Uh, it's really been a great, um, um, this has been really good. Um, we're getting a lot of information and be able to take this and uh, and use it for us to uh, digest and, and, and come up with a, a good uh, analysis for that. Um, just to piggyback uh, back with uh, Alfred, uh, we are planning to, uh, you know, that's the next thing that we're working on now is, is developing the focus group and talking with uh, uh, getting some of the contact fro uh, people from different focus groups. Um, specifically, I'll be um, um, both locations at um, Gate City Boulevard and at West Market Street, Dallas and Centers, uh, other uh, agencies and so. Uh, so Courtney and myself are uh, working with uh, that and, and, and we'll be uh, reaching out to see when will be the best time to, um, to do that. Um, so um, Alfred, if you could, you can uh, maybe pass the word along with um, um, the um, staff members over at uh, ILB just to see what the consensus will be the best time and the best uh, you know, way to, uh, to have everyone, if it's something that we can a better time for everyone to be together. Uh, we could do a one mass uh, presentation or a uh, meeting that way. Um, that would be great if you can provide that uh, to us. Um, that would be helpful. But that is our next steps are to develop these focus groups and, 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 and develop time to meet with uh, them to gather some more information. I will pass that along to HR and to Dean and Joshua to um, get them to start working on that. That'd be great. That'd Thank be great. you. And Ms. Jackson, I would love, I was trying to get in uh, a question to you, but I, I was curious exactly where do you, you know, what, uh, uh, 
Excuse me? What retirement location that you were saying you were about a half a mile away from the bus stop? Um, we are just about, okay. Um, are you familiar with um, Mount Zion Church? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I live now, as you know, right there in front of Mount Zion Church. That's a bus stop, okay? Yes, ma'am. I live down Alamance Church Road. Okay. About, just about almost uh, three quarters or like a half a mile down, okay? Real Park. You got it. How, how do you know? <laughs> I, know? I know Greensboro, so yes, I know that area. Hey, thank you, yes. I live um, on Real Park Drive, not Real Park States. I can't afford them, okay? Right. But on Will Park. So now you know that distance, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And and the people in this building that's in wheelchairs or on walkers. Yes, ma'am. And and since you know the area, you and you know the homeowners in this area refused to have a sidewalk and, and they fought against it because they didn't want people going in to some of their property to build the sidewalk. If, if um, you from Greensboro and you know that, you know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that's the problem here. I, I can't speak, I, I cannot speak no place else, George. I can only talk about here. Right. And I have, me personally, I have had two knee replacements. I walk on a cane. And my eyesight is going, so I need, I need. Well, I call, I still call it scat. I understand. Right, and it's hard to. Um, uh, we just can't walk up there, right. and you know that's a walk, and. And, and, even also, if you, and also a bus, it'd be tough for a bus to get down there and turn around and come back out as well. Exactly. <laughs> challenging area. I, I know that very well. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Okay. So that's the problem here. I can't speak about no place else in Greensboro. Yes, no, exactly well. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's one of the areas there that is, uh, is very challenging for uh, fixed route. Um, we looked at that before. Uh, and that and the sidewalk situation is i understand that that uh issue as well so uh so we're we're trying to do the best we can to provide the services uh, the best service for everyone so i think again uh, partic uh everyone that participated today I, I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart uh, this has been really a good effort i appreciate uh acom and the staff members with acom uh, i think he did an outstanding job tonight um, and uh, we'll definitely, we'll keep everyone abreast of what the next steps will be and keep you uh, informed of the analysis as we go forward.